I'm Andreas Ropstorff. I work at Aarhus University in Denmark, uh, partly in social anthropology and partly at the Faculty of Health Sciences in brain imaging. Um, I have a dual background in social anthropology and in neurobiology. And since my first years of studies, I haven't quite been able to decide whether I belonged in the humanities or in the natural sciences. And over the years, that hesitance almost became a career in its own right. And I've now found a ways to be kind of with one foot in the humanities and one foot in, in health science and natural sciences. At Aarhus University, I'm involved in a number of interdisciplinary initiatives. Uh, we have a large framework at the university that studies cognition and neuroscience across all disciplines called MindLab. And that has access to excellent scanning facilities, EEG, fMRI, MET, etc. at the Center for Functional Integrative Neurosciences. And I've been involved in, in getting that up and running, and in particular in connecting people from social sciences and humanities to those more experimental approaches. Um, I'm also, uh, since a couple of months, directing a new interdisciplinary center at the university called the Interacting Minds Center. Um, and whereas our scanners and some of the cognitive work there is very much centered around methods that people share, the Interacting Mind Center is a different form of interdisciplinarity because here people come from all of university interested in the same topic. So interested in what is it that happens when people interact with each other? What are the emergent features? How can you study that in various experimental ways? And here experimental means not just using the experiment as a method, but also thinking experimentally. So thinking in novel ways about, you know, how do we gather these forms of knowledge how do we set people together? How do we came up, come up with new frames for interaction and for studying interaction? I first became involved in, in functional brain imaging around 1999 and 2000. At that time I had a project based in anthropology where as an anthropologist I was kind of studying this new field of functional brain imaging. So in other words, my tribe of people, those that I studied, were those people that used scanners to create new forms of knowledge. And what I was very interested in at that time was what happens when people with different backgrounds from psychology, philosophy, and the clinical sciences and physics suddenly come to work together to overlap with each other because new technologies, in this instance brain scanners, means that they have to meet with each other and somehow agree on how they make knowledge and what technologies can be used for. So that was my start in functional imaging. Uh, and then at a slightly later time, one of my field sites, to use an ethnographic metaphor, they asked me if I would work with them rather than study them. So in other words, they suggested that I could be involved in setting up a cognitive research environment in Aarhus. And part of my work then was to find out, well, you know, what can we use scanners for? Which kind of questions could we sensibly ask with scanners? Um, what I could see when I did the anthropology of functional imaging was that at that time, about 12 or 13 years ago, scanning experiments were thought of very much in behaviorist terms. So the idea was that, you know, persons were something that received stimuli and could reply with a response and the scanner would detect what happened in the brain in the meantime. But when I looked at it from an anthropological point of view, I could see the kind of surrounding this stimulus and response was an awful lot of social interaction. It was about people agreeing about the situation, understanding what was at stake, explaining rules and systems and stimuli and to each other. And I found it paradoxical that this element of social interaction, which was critical to run the experiment, was not visible from the knowledge that came out of it. So I said, yeah, I would be very interested in in being involved in cognitive brain imaging, but my heart would be in trying to, to work at this interaction and see if we could come up with experiments that would also study what happens in interaction. And uh, over the last years, the research group in Aarhus has been you know, doing all sorts of functional imaging. Some of it is quite traditional, uh, and some of it has tried to open up that issue of interaction using either scanners and increasingly other methods. One of the key topics we have worked with is the interplay between top-down processing and bottom-up processing. Uh, so you can say if you're only interested in what goes on in the senses, 
that type of research will say that something hits the sensory organs and that creates effects in the brain. This is kind of a, a bottom-up process. But what the cognitive imaging field is increasingly concerned about, and this is also a long tradition in cognitive psychology, is that the bottom-up doesn't do it on its own. It's really critical to see also how expectations and understandings of a situation are shaping, so to say, top-down what's going to happen to those inputs that come in there. And looking at the interplay between top-down and bottom-up has been one of the areas that we have been very much interested in. It might be a matter of using attention as a top-down process to guide what goes on in processing, but it can also be a matter of looking at how would expertise in a particular field allow you, so to say, to do something different with the stimuli than you can do without expertise. And we have seen that in a number of fields, for instance, in processing of music. I've in particular worked together with a jazz musician and cognitive uh, scientist called Peter Wust. He has a background in jazz music, and as such, he has an extremely good sense of what's important in jazz music, and it has to do with rhythm. Um, so we constructed a number of imaging experiments that looked at how would people be processing rhythms and breaks in rhythm. And in particular, in does it make a difference whether you are a musician or a non-musician in how you experience and how your brain reacts to the unexpected in rhythms. And Peter could design some very kind of ecologically sensible studies that reminded quite a lot of what goes on in music. And there we could show that um, musicians and non-musicians seem to process violations in rhythmic expectations quite differently. If you're a non-musician, most of that processing seems to go on in the right hemisphere of the brain, whereas musicians shifted that processing to the left hemisphere of the brain. And as you probably know, left hemisphere is typically associated with language processing. So our kind of tongue-in-cheek interpretation was that, you know, music can be like a language, but only if you're a musician, because you need the skills in order to do something with that stimuli in the left hemisphere. Some of the stuff that we have been interested in and that Peter and others has been working with is precisely, you know, what are the links between music processing and language processing. Um, language, for anyone interested in interactions, is obviously very cru crucial because some of the things that we seem to be able to do with language, with each other, is to set up patterns of expectations, plans for actions, etc., that are in a way in your mind without you necessarily having experienced it before. So one interpretation is that language is very good at setting up possibilities for top-down control and top-down monitoring. Language, so to say, can shape the response space for actions and the sensory space for incoming information. Um, and we have worked together with some extremely skilled linguists and some musicians who have tried to tease apart what is it that language do and how would language processing, so to say, tie in with other forms of cognitive processing in the brain. And Miguel Valentin, uh, one of the key researchers in language, so he has, for instance, been interested in what happens when you hear verbs that contain motion as opposed to verbs that contain no motion. And it seems that these verbs that contain motion, like running, etc., as opposed to no motion words like standing, they activate parts of the brain that would also be activated in processing of visual motion and action motion. So one hypothesis that we and others are working on is that, you know, somehow language, when you understand it, seems to work by setting up kind of an external, internal space of representation that basically acts on and ties in with the same areas of the brain that would be activated if you did the action or had the experiences yourself. So in that sense, language seems to be, as we call it, a, a critical tool for interacting minds. And this is something we have been extremely interested in looking at. So in that understanding, you can say language might be one of the critical tools in which we as humans interact with each other and modify each other's top-down processing. And that has huge consequences for what goes on bottom up. So you can say if, if language is this kind of tool for interacting minds, if what people do with each other is we set up these patterns of expectancy, um, then we might find something similar going on also in very complex cultural phenomena like religion. You can say religion is probably one of the ways in which people can share kind of higher order understandings of the world. 
that shape the way that you expect things to happen in the world and they provide you with models for what might be going on. And here the link between religion as a very abstract phenomenon and activities in the brain might in a way go via fields like cognitive semiotics or cognitive linguistics that are starting to get some very formalized tools for understanding what is it language do, what is it representations and scripts do. And that again are beginning to tie in with understandings of, of brain processes. Um, there is one particular field where um, I think religion can also tell us something quite basic about brain function or the studies of religion and either how the, or the higher cognitive phenomenon. Um, and that is currently there are some novel models of, of brain of understanding brain function which are very much in vogue, very fashionable and very interesting because they seem productive. These models are known as Bayesian models or predictive coding models. And in this understanding of the brain, uh, in a way what the brain is concerned about is constantly to trying to figure out what might happen next. And it suggests that there are a constant interplay between, so to say, predictions of what's going to happen and sensory input, and if these things match up to each other, if they cancel out, you can say the brain and the person have understood the situation. But if there is a mismatch between the two, this is a sign that something in the surroundings were not understood. Now, this model of the brain is very interesting because it can quite easily also be translated to higher cultural phenomena. Because precisely what we might be establishing in each other are these higher level models of understanding, of expectancy, of probabilities, etc. And probably culture is very much, and religion is very much involved in setting up these patterns as such. And people are currently also um, examining whether maybe also some of the more strange phenomenon within religion can be understood within such a framework. You know, is it playing on instances of prediction? Is it playing with instances of breaks and expectations, etc.? So we do not have a clear picture of how these things are going to relate to each other. But there are very interesting rapports mediated by things like shared understanding, by patterns of expectation, by models for action, where the same language in a way seems to be transferable between very basic brain functions and what was hitherto known as very kind of abstract cultural phenomenon like religion. We have actually seen something quite similar in the studies of music, where you can say a lot of classical theories about music developed within musicology would say that what music is constantly playing with is an interplay between expectations and tensions that are met and resolved, etc. Right? And you know, very interesting, you can almost word by word transfer that into current models of brain function, that maybe music is precisely attractive to the brain because in an interplay with your prior knowledge, it sets up these patterns of expectations that are resolved and established and resolved and established. So in that sense, um, you can say it seems as if there is a much more fruitful and fertile move back and forth between models and understandings of the brain and these higher collective and individual phenomena. And that things like expectations, like models of the world, like breaches in probabilities, etc., they might be some of the tools that can make us move conceptually between these different levels and do experiments that challenge these different levels. I think one of the things that's becoming quite you know, obvious with the brain imaging results is that, and this was known also in cognitive psychology, but it tends to carry larger weight when you see scans, kind of images lightening up of the brain, right? Um, is that the stimuli are not just stimuli, it's really critical how attention in a way prepares you for a particular type of stimuli. And along those lines, it's also becoming increasingly important that attention is not just attention that attention is something you need to be prepared for or maybe skilled in doing and exerting. And I think this was what we saw in our musical examples, right? That if you're a musician, you're able to pick up distinctions in music that could otherwise not be done and you can do things with it in ways that couldn't be done otherwise. So along those lines, it seems that, that some of the things that goes on in enculturation or in other forms of training is also an education not just of the senses but also of attention. So an ability not only to discriminate between things, but also to do something with those discriminations. And um, that might be, in a way, one, one level where you can start to get a handle of what might be the mechanisms that mediate between relatively basic functions 
and those complex phenomena that we are constantly engaged in. Something that we are currently very interested in, and we haven't done imaging studies of it, but we have done some behavioral studies of it, is uh, to what extent are two people working together able, so to share, to help each other to get a better attention to the surrounding worlds. One of our postdocs, Bahadur Barami, constructed what I thought was a very elegant experiment where two people had to solve a task together. And basically, they should look at images and detect errors in those images. And then if they could agree on which of the images that had an error, that first thing was fine. But if they disagreed, they could talk for as long as they wanted until they came up with a common solution. And Bahadur could show that the two people working in diets were under normal circumstances much better at solving these tasks than each of them were on their own. So in other words, working as a common system mediated not by shared brains, but really shared minds through language, the two of them could come up with a solution to a problem that has to do with attention and perceptual processing that was much better jointly than it was on their own. And I think this is going to be a very new and interesting field of research, not just in our group, but in other groups as well. Namely, how is it that people in a way can distribute and also bring together different people's attention and attentional resources into coming up with solutions to problems. Sometimes it can be better, at other times it might be something that can be led astray. But this ability to, so to say, exist or to share worlds with each other that are both perceptual and mental, that's something that we are becoming incredibly interested in. Because that seems to be really a hallmark of what human interaction and human culture by extension is very much about. So obviously the type of questions that we are discussing here, you know, this is something that no person can solve on their own. It requires competences from all sorts of disciplines. Uh, and in the Interacting Minds Research Center and the Interacting Minds Research Group that came before that, you know, we have kind of people coming from all sorts of university uh, to our regular meetings. And very few of those people, in a way, are there because they are paid to be there. Most of them have their salaries in other places and have obligations at different departments, but, but somehow a, an, an atmosphere of collaboration has emerged that seems to, to attract people to get in there. Um, and I've tried to think about you know, what, what has been the tools of setting that up. And one of them is a classical cultural phenomenon called tradition. So basically for the last six or eight years, I think we have met every Tuesday at 11 o'clock whenever people were around to meet. And uh, the idea is to meet at 11, someone gives a talk, it can be one of our own, it can be a visitor. And that's also f always followed by another tradition, namely a free sandwich to everyone. And that means that people then stay afterwards for lunch and they have a chance to discuss and meet with each other. And we can see the kind of recurrent feature of just meeting up every Tuesday or having something going on every Tuesday is also, I think, for the dissemination of knowledge really important. Because it means that a lot of these people here you know, they, we build up kind of a shared understanding, a shared common ground of problems and approaches. Um, and the sandwich kind of means that you might need to leave your office anyway to go for lunch. So going for the meeting is not that different from it. And it's actually during the discussions over lunch that you know, new projects are developed or new people coming to the group can be introduced to this or to this person that where things might be happening. Uh, and something very interesting has been developed over the last years is that, that we can see that that now projects are just emerging almost on their own among people who were present. Uh, recently we had one project that I heard about at a very late stage. and It was almost something that was ready to be written up. And it was people from linguistics, from semiotics, from clinical psychology studying schizophrenia and clinical psychology studying autism that came up with a very elegant idea to basically look at the intonations of people's voices when they had different forms of uh, disorders, autism, schizophrenia, depression, etc. And then use some very sophisticated but quite automatized methods to say something quantitatively about how people's voices were going up and down. And I only heard about the project, you know, when it was basically ready to be published. And at first I felt kind of, you know, why didn't anyone tell me about it at an earlier stage? But of course this was really the beauty of the project, that things just seemed to happen more or less of their own, because people come together and they share ideas and they know exactly how to take things further. So I think what, what's been critical with us is actually setting up some sort of a tradition of meeting on a regular basis, creating a space for discussion and creating also some incentives to be there even if it's something that might not be central to your own topic. Because it's precisely through those mechanisms that you can see everyone kind of builds up a set of common knowledges 
that means that they can create new projects on their own and on new interfaces. It's also very interesting to see what works and what doesn't work at these seminars. So I think the best seminars are those where people present in a way relatively undigested material. It might be an idea for a research design or it might be some data that they are struggling to deal with. In a way when they throw raw meat on the table that everyone can get a hold of and grab on and think with and do something with. I mean, don't mistake us. All researchers, all scientists, they're also predators by nature and very competitive. Uh, everyone has been, in a way, selected for being able to do things on their own on things they find important and interesting. And we can see that those seminars that fail, where people go away with a bad atmosphere, are often these situations where maybe only theoretical ideas are presented, or something is presented that doesn't allow think people to think along with it. And there we can see two social dynamics occur. Either the group starts eating themselves, or they start eating the person coming into the room. So it seems that a critical feature of this is actually to present something, throw something on the table that's not yet digested. And then everyone can, in a way, feed into it and fit into it. And we see very interesting and productive discussions developing. But that's been kind of my own, my own experiences uh, in it. So I think everyone working in the brain imaging field has kind of a double relationship to the brain images, right? Because many of us also got attracted into it because you know, there has been all this public hype about suddenly we can see a particular part of the brain lightening up when people do something. You know, here is the center for religion, for love and for all sorts of other things. And in a way, the first thing people learn when they enter into the emitting laboratory as students wanting to play around with the technologies is that machines are not cameras, it's not photographs that we're looking at. Really, we're looking at something that might resemble more of cartoons, so really is kind of a way of representing very complicated mathematics. And at a point, you also start to understand that a lot of ideas about I mean, what people are like, a lot of ideas about what the machines are doing, a lot of ideas about the nature of the neural signal, of the coupling to the hemodynamics, to the blood flow, etc., are in a way embedded in the images as well. So the more you work with the images, the more one becomes in a way uh, kind of, not uncertain, but kind of very sensitive to what the images are actually showing. And the images, in a way, have a double life. One is when you see them in newspapers or on the TV or in the public sphere where, you know, this might be the brain of a criminal and that area lights up or does not light up. And then the other one is when you make them in a laboratory where, you know, from any particular experiments, you can produce many different images. And we all know that. And the whole trick really is to come up with ways of making these images, ways of representing the data, basically ways of telling stories that we believe are right at the given moment, giving the knowledge that we have with them. So there is a very, it's almost like a double-edged sword, sword, this idea that now we can take images of our inner workings, because this is not what we're doing. But yet it's a very powerful technology to allow things to be measured, allow things to be opened that couldn't be opened before. And I think we can see quite interestingly, not just in our group, but in the research field as such, kind of a move away from treating the scanner is almost a magical tool that tells what people are really thinking at a particular time, onto being just one way of measuring things in parallel with all sorts of other ways of measuring things. And you see that the best studies currently done are precisely relating many different measures and many different things into telling complex but also quite convincing narratives. Now this understanding of the image, of the complexities of the image, you know, that this is maybe more a symbol than an index of something that points to reality, might not have penetrated into the outer world yet. And to some extent, us making the images might be guilty of that too. Because it's a very convincing narrative, for instance, if you have a child with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and a doctor shows you that this is the brain of a child with ADHD and this is one without ADHD, and you see an area lightening up, you know, it becomes very much real what's inside it. But inside research fields, it doesn't really look like that. It's like genetics, it's like biochemistry, uh, it's one measure among other measures. But there is a certain lure, a certain idea about actually we can open up our minds to investigation, which is driving that. And don't get me wrong, I think one of the very interesting aspects where cognitive 
imaging has also changed the research field is precisely in kind of showing images of what could otherwise not be shown. So pain research has been a field that has advanced a lot. You know, typically you would say brain, pain is inherently subjective. There is no way to tell anything about which kind of pain other people experience. But through a set of very controlled experiments, you know, people are starting to get an understanding of particular regions of the brain lightening up when people are experiencing physical pain. And suddenly you get an idea about, well, maybe pain is also something that, you know, although you can't see it from the outside and although it is an internal experience, has a certain type of solidity to it. People have studied also uh, schizophrenic patients when they hear voices and here are classical studies that show that when they report they hear voices their auditory cortex kind of light up similar to what would happen when they heard voices. In other words suggesting that the phenomenology, the experience might not be what is wrong but there is something about the system which is configured in different ways. So certainly scanners have opened up you can say an internal space for investigations but it's very critical to understand also that we are not taking photographs of it. It is very complex ways of representing, you know, complicated biology, complicated measurements, complicated technologies. And this is something that you learn on the first day that you enter the laboratory, at, that you in a way keep relearning every time a new technology, a new method is being applied. One of the things that's been really interesting about working in Aarhus is that we have attracted an unusual lot of people to the experiments and to the scanners. In many places, this is kind of a marriage that goes on between psychologists trained in a particular behaviorist tradition and uh, a particular form of medical people and a particular form of physicist. But for various historical reasons, the development was different in Denmark that, uh, or in Aarhus. In a way, we got a lot of people from the humanities, from philosophy, from linguistics, from anthropology, from studies of religion to become interested in thinking about cognitive problems in ways that could be translated into an experimental framework. And I can see that this has given our research a, a particular style. It's simply other questions that are being asked. And you can say, once other questions are being asked, a different form of knowledge is being produced. And a critical element here has been that, that we have found ways of getting access to the machines to people from different backgrounds. Now, there are actually very few other places in the world where similar things are happening. Uh, and to my knowledge, one of the few places where you see a similar development is precisely here in Brno, around uh, Levina, this new center for, for the experimental studies of religion, where also in an interesting way you see people coming from psychology, from studies of religion, from philosophy, meeting up with people that has a classical experimental background and probably also going to have a, a neuroscience background. And I think what we have seen at our place is that once you do these things, competences become spread in, in, in strange ways. So one of our best experts in EEG studies is currently at the Institute of Linguistics, which is not where you would usually find a, an EEG expert. And I think you're going to see something very similar here as well, that once you give people the, in a way, possibility and to some extent freedom to build up the necessary competences, and we bring them together in novel constellations with access to machines and access to resources. Now that generates very interesting ways that competences are being made, questions are being asked, and therefore also that you basically get novel answers than you had hitherto. It's not that science is relativistic that anything goes, but you have to bear in mind that you know, if you don't ask the question, you're not going to get that type of answer. So therefore, these novel constellations of competences being brought together is really critical for changing the form of knowledge that we produce, not by making other forms of knowledge invalid, but by basically kind of opening up new fields to a particular style of knowledge, and therefore also, in a way, forcing other people to relate to these areas here. This is what we have seen during the last 10 years in cognitive imaging. 10 years ago, it was very much about stimulus response, these days it's all about social interaction and it's all about joint action and things like that. And I think the next move is going to have a lot to do with the more abstract forms of shared understanding. And something like religion is a critical element for doing just that. And we really need people internationally, people who can, so to say, move quite systematically between these very abstract levels of religion and other cultural phenomena like identity via quite concrete ideas, like you might find them in semiotics or in cognitive linguistics and in other places, that allow some of these ideas to be translated into experiments 
and can be tried out and related to other forms of knowledge. It's not that this is the only way of making knowledge. I'm not saying that all humanities should do exactly that. But I think there is an enormous advantage gained from, so to say, dismantling previous strong alliances between questions and methods and theories. And this is what we are currently seeing. Right? You might have an interest in a field, and you can marry that with competences and ways of asking questions that come through other fields. It takes interdisciplinarity to do it, because you need to, in a way, validate the links that you do when you jump on one field to another field. But that's precisely why you need a group like the one you're creating in Levina. You need people based in every tradition that can say, well, actually, this is a sensible way to do it. We can, with our competences and our tradition, stand for the moves that has been done here. And that's what's needed to create forms of knowledge that we haven't hitherto seen in this field.